All right, we got us another episode of Dragging Up the Past here. We're going to check out Dragon number 73. Jim, how you doing? Oh, it's good. It's good. I, I like it when we stay in the low numbers. This is, this makes, let's see, Dragon 73, so we're talking about... You want to guess and, without and, having to look? And, and, did uh, you already look? Just doing the... Uh, uh, 85. Now you're a little too high. Too high. Okay. This is, what is this it? The middle of 83. Okay. And, Spring. And the Summer. reason I grabbed this one in particular, this is the first issue of Dragon Magazine that I ever purchased off the rack at a store. Aw. Now, I had read others before this, you know, borrowed some friends' copies here and there. Uh, but this, now, part of the reason for that is most of my game purchasing up to that point, I mean, I had a bunch of the AD&D rule books. I had the uh, the old red and blue, uh, no prefix D and D box sets. Um, I had a handful of modules, all of which were purchased at various toy stores around town. Uh, I started role playing when we were living out in California, um, out in Monterey, California, and then I got a couple of things for Christmas that the year that we moved to Virginia. Uh, we were only there for six months while my dad was in a school for his military career. But then, uh, again, any game stuff that I bought, I was buying at toy stores, which weren't stock in the magazines because those belonged over in the bookstores or on newsstands. And, and I wasn't really hanging out in any of those at the time. So once we moved to Germany um, in, in 83, once we moved to Germany, we had the Stars and Stripes bookstores available to us over there. And they stocked a ton of different magazines, including Dragon. And so while I had read plenty of issues of Dragon magazine up before this, this was the first one that I actually bought off the newsstand for myself. So there's uh, All right. there's so definitely I, I, some nostalgia for me in this one. I forgot to uh, I forgot to do this on the last episode. It's something I want to punch at real quick. What was the number one song in America first week in May 1983? <sighs> Hang on a second. The number one song in America in May of 83, Say, 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 Paul McCartney and Michael Jackson. Ooh, not a bad one, but I don't see it even on the list. Let's Dance, David, David Bowie. David Bowie. Say, Say, Say was the number one song for the year on the Billboard Hot 100, and, and I thought uh, it was earlier in the year that it was released, and so that's where I was going with that one. So, and what was the number one movie of that week? You'll never get this one, because I... I knew, I know of it, but I had certainly forgotten it. Number one movie of May of 83. Ah, Silkwood. Not, it's on the list. No, Valley Girl. Oh, really? Directed by Martha Coolidge, starring Nicholas Cage. Cage. Nicholas Cage. Yes. Uh, based on a song that Frank Zappa later regretted ever writing. And, uh, and, and he was Nicholas Cage by then, right? Not Nicholas Coppola? Correct. Okay. Well, because in Fast Times at Ridgemont High, he's credited as Nicholas Coppola. That is correct. And and you want to talk about a movie that uh, that spawned some careers? Fast Times at Ridgemont High starred three future Oscar winners. Think of that. So, what'll be fun is if people can name them without having to IMDb them. So, we'll, we'll see if anybody can throw that in the forums. There were three future Best Actor Oscar winners. In Fast Times at Ridgemont High. Clearly, Nicolas Cage would be one of them because we were talking about it. Yes. Did you want to take a guess at the other two? Sean Penn. Sean Penn's Sean Penn's another. Yes. Can you get the third? Does Ray win one? No. He doesn't, does he? No. Nope. Nope. I don't know who the third. I don't know who the third is. Forrest Whitaker. Is ah yeah yeah. He's the linebacker. Yep, sure is. So, yes. All right. Let's uh, dive into Dragon number 73 here. Uh, a Harn ad. Harn ads were ubiquitous at this time. Um, and unlike Rollmaster, Harn is still around. <laughs> <laughs> and doing quite well. There are some people who swear by it. Well, it, it's interesting because I like the Harn books. I enjoy reading through them. I've I I have several. 
I like the guys from Columbia. Um, Firkin Absolutely. was next to us uh, back when Firkin still worked for Columbia. He was next to us at the very first Origins I was ever an exhibitor at with Bayonet Games, and he was he was one of the few guys that was actually really nice to us while we were there. Um, mm -hmm. we, well, it's it's amazing, you know. The, the wargaming community is not that big, um, and and they at the time. So this was two thousand five. Um, they came across as fiercely territorial. Um, the, the booth we were in, we had Columbia right next to us, but we had MMP directly across the aisle from us. And they spent the entire four games giving us the stink, the, the entire four days giving us the stink eye. Um, it was like Clash of Arms wouldn't talk to us. GMT wouldn't talk to us. These guys would not talk to us at all. The only people that talked to us were the Avalanche Press guys, and that's because we were talking about soccer with them. Um, yeah. it was, it was crazy. Um, but the uh, Firkin was a blast to sit there and chat with. You know, we flipped through some Harn stuff, talked about it a bit. Um, one of the things that I always enjoyed was one of the the books that I published uh, with Bayonet Games many many moons ago um, was uh, one of the reviewers out there compared it favorably to Harn. Um, All right. I thought that was that was very complimentary of him. Um, all right, we've we've talked the role master discussions to death, but at this point we're up to claw law, arms law, character spell, <laughs> you know, who knows what else. And again, as you said, I don't know that anybody ever played role master as role master, but I think a lot of people used them as reference books for other things. Yep. Um All right. As we've noted on previous recordings, is this a video cast? It's not really a podcast. What do we call this? Previous shows. We'll go with shows. There you go. Shows. Um, Episodes. We're, we're going to point out paste-up challenges. Like the giant god dang white box around Kim Mohan's name down. <laughs> Come on, people. <laughs> Transparencies to, aren't that hard to do. Needed to... Really, nope, nope. Need, and needed to sign it, too, with his own John Hancock. I'm totally cool with him signing it. Sign it on a piece of transparency or else go make a copy onto a piece of transparency and use the transparency in the paste up. That way the gray shows through the back. Come on, people. This wasn't that hard to do. Oy, yi, 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 yi. All right, so our special attraction, we've got a D&D &D adventure in here. We've got a new NPC. As we've noted before, let's face it, lots of people wanted to play those characters. Um, well, there's a solo scenario in this one. And then... Uh, some non-violent magic items. There's there's actually some neat things in there, um, but but this is uh, kind of some interesting, different. Uh, let's face it, there's there's no real tent pole article or tent pole item in here. Uh, what's key about this one is this was the first one I ever bought off the rack, and so let's take a look at what somebody you know sort of oh I got my own dragon magazine. What they're seeing as they're flipping through here, um, the. Uh, one thing in here, probably noticed right away, this issue of Dragon Magazine looks different from all the others in your collection. Fancy phrase is design changes, right? New typeface we're using, Baskerville. Putting in the columns is called Ragged Right. Go ahead, Jim. <sighs> all right, <laughs> folks, don't do that. Your ancestors climbed up out of the primordial soup to get you heat, air conditioning, penicillin, houses, and right justification. Don't do this. <laughs> um, and uh, so, so there's, there's some layout changes uh, that start manifesting themselves in this particular issue. Um, so we have out on a limb, we have our analog message board going on there um, to include some chilly comments. And hey, we've got a math mistake. Oh my gosh, there's a math mistake. <laughs> This is, I, I, I will always love, I will always love the conversation about how much cubic space a fireball fills based on the level of the caster. Yes. And uh, it, it, it is, it is, this is very much of a piece with that. I'm no one to criticize. I certainly have enjoyed these nerdy conversations. But to the internal credit of the editors herein, they cop to their mistake. Yes. Yes. Um, all right. The, uh, the Crypts of Chaos ad. Um, so here we are, the Duelist. One of the things that I appreciate about the Duelist here is that the introduction includes a, a 
cute little short story. There is a bit of, of, of a tale around the duelist sitting down to go about his thing. Um, and so that's, that, you know, that's the first column and a half ish of this article is just sort of setting the stage for, for how the duelist comes into play. And so let's, uh, let's, let's, you know, why is the duelist there? He fights other guys, fights for them. Um, and it, it's worth mentioning, and I and one can certainly take this too far, and I'd be curious, but I'd still be curious to be able to track back the different streams of this. And what I'm referring to is the roots of D&D were called chainmail, right? Chainmail, that's you know, as early as the late Roman Empire and before even, but certainly Dark Ages and High Middle Ages. This is clearly a Renaissance and, and early modern inflected type of character look at the weapon he's wielding look at his stance and his clothes and heavens forbid look at that look at the panache on his hat it would make my boy Cyrano proud uh, this is this is evidently part of this metamorphosis I don't even the broadening of d d to include a much wider range of fantasy tropes or literary tropes and types and I think if, if my memory serves, the duelist is the first character that I recall all thinking, hey, you got some renaissance in my medieval. <laughs> and uh, and um, it's an interesting character class. It uh, is one I actually rather like a lot and can say I've had characters play. Not well, my characters, but people I was running. It's interesting the way you, the way you reference that. There's... Um, in it's it's one of the GURPS books, and I want to say it's the GURPS Middle Ages book. There's this classic high fantasy painting on the cover, but when you open it up on one of the first one or two pages, it talks about sort of the common misconception of high fantasy imagery, and it, it sits there and breaks down the painting that says, the armor is from this period, the crown is from this period, the cape is from this period, this guy is dressed this way, but he's riding this kind of saddle on this kind of horse, and and just talks about how all of the things that we think of as sort of archetypal high fantasy are a complete mishmash from all over the place. Hmm. So, um, so yeah. Um, that's, uh, that's definitely kind of a thing that, uh, that, you know, folks got to sort of pay attention to there. Um, it, it crossed genres quite a bit. And, uh, and that's, that, that was the reality that we dealt with as players. So here we have your Renaissance duelist invading everyone else's medieval game. Yes. Wah. <laughs> So, um, well, no, and, and and like, and I'm not offended by it. I, it's a fantasy game, for heaven's sakes. It's allowed to have its own narrative. Yeah, I just find it interesting. Yes, yes. Um, so, yeah, as uh, as we've got here for as long as personal combat has been going on, there have been specialists who would sell their prowess at it. Um, and, and by so, the way, one of the great, one of the best books, or books, best movies on the Napoleonic Wars, bar none is The Duelist, starring <laughs> Harvey Keitel. All right, so uh, mandatory XP table with level titles. Mm -hmm. Must with have... names and titles no one ever used, but we've yes. gone over that. Yes. Um, not, not only that, but apparently you move up from Fencer to Challenger to Gladiator, as opposed to starting as a Gladiator and working your way up where you just got thrown into the pits as a gladiator. Um, right. Yet again, a table crying for a monospace font or some form of better justification than they inflicted upon us, especially, like, right yep. here. What, did they hit the space bar between each one of those zeros and the 5,000? Come on, people. This is sloppy. <laughs> this is sloppy. I do like that they gave them 12-sided hit points, 12-sided hit dice for their hit points. You, you could really take a hit if you were a duelist. Yes, you could. So, um, you, the the key thing there was lots of dexterity. Um, but you could only be a human or a half-elf. What, there were no dwarven duelists? Come on. <laughs> no? Don't question. 
Are you starting something? <laughs> is that what you're trying to do? Of course. Okay, just checking. Is it I, I'm not taking the bait. I'm not taking the bait. These are these were. <laughs> this was a balanced game. I was just told that. Yes. <laughs> um, the, a, a fairly short weapons list that you have as options. Not a lot of duelists running around with pole arms. Um, might might have made for an interesting character, but um, you know, it's uh, you're a swordsman, right? The occasional yep. duelist with the quarter staff running around, but you were you were essentially a swordsman. Um, yes, I do like that you had multiple attacks per round. Though once you got up there a bit, at level fifteen, you got five attacks every two rounds. So you get oh. two attacks per round plus a bonus whack at the guy. You're going to be going through stuff of same or lesser level like a hot knife through butter, but I think everybody who's ever played D&D knows that by now. Yes. Yes. Um, I, so so I have a bit of a, an irk here with the fact that, first of all, we, we've talked before that nobody really gave a rat's ass about alignments, right? I mean, we, we got it. But if you're going to put them in here, the fact that the duelist had the option to be chaotic neutral I, I kind of have an issue with. Like, the whole point of the duelist was there was sort of this code of conduct that is even described in the article here that there is a certain way these guys behave, that they're going to take the money, but they're going to do the job for the money. And the chaotic neutral guy has got just as much, you know, look, chaotic neutrals like, you know, the, uh, it, it's, it's the Jared Leto Joker, right? I mean, it's, you know, completely off your rocker there. And that's not the way duelists behave. Um, you could make a pretty decent case for lawful evil, which isn't an option. Um, but I don't know how you make a case for a chaotic neutral as a, uh, as a valid alignment for a duelist. Well, let me go back then, if we're going to have that conversation, to one of my first principles of any form of role-playing or really literature writing or, or fiction drawing, which is... Give me an example in literature of this duelist character as you imagine him. Yeah. Yeah. You know, who is he? You know, is he, uh, is, you know, and there's, there are a lot of duelists and, in literature and they're not just, and they're not just fantasy. They're not just Renaissance. They're, they're in the wild west. Well, and, and I'll tell you who, who probably springs to mind for most people are the three musketeers. Okay. That's probably the first one to jump to mind when when you start thinking of dueling swordsmen. Um, now, I say that, again, this may be one of those 40-line things that some folks under the 40-line, the first thing they're thinking of is uh, is the Dread Pirate Roberts and Indigo Montoya. There you go. Which is not a bad first frame of reference, right? That's totally cool. Um, but, but those folks are a little too young to really have a good Three Musketeers frame of reference. So, right. Um, that's, uh, <clears throat> but, you know, again, any of those guys, none of them are acting in a chaotic, neutral way. And in fact, I think you would have a hard time coming up with an example of a duelist type character, uh, whether it's from, from CJ Cherry's Derny series or, you know, from Eddings or from anything else that behaved in a chaotic, neutral fashion. Those guys just don't exist. Right. I, 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 I challenge I anyone to come up with a legit chaotic neutral duelist from the worlds of fantasy anywhere. Film I think or movie. You just, I think you just bought yourself out of being able to criticize me for my uh, <laughs> desire my desire to meta narrate fantasy roleplay characters. <laughs> just saying. Uh, don't expect consistency from me. Come on, you know better. All right, all right. <laughs> Uh, I do like that there's the fencing master and his school, because one of the things that was always prevalent in D&D &D was the idea that once you develop up to a particular level of renown, that what's the next thing that's going to happen? You become right. some leader that starts to attract various followers that, that come in to do stuff. And so whether you're running your own stronghold as a leader or whether you're running your own Thieves Guild. Um, and we're going to have a guest vocal appearance by my cat here who just jumped up in my lap. So so Dusty is joining Jim and Brant for this episode of Dragging Up the Past here. Um, duelists 
run fencing schools, which, um, you know, given the kind of rules and information that they put in place here, um, you know, some of it's annoyingly detailed. Hiring a fencing master as a teacher will ta cost 200 gold pieces a month. Absolutely no variance allowed for, you know, local economy or anything like that. It's just a flat 200 anywhere you go in the world or any world you go to. Um, but, but it is nice that they give you some basic rules for sort of what should happen with a fencing master in his school. Um, this is sort of the, the realm, the stronghold, the principality of the duelist. Um, but it is cool to see that they put that in place. Um, I did think that was a nice touch for this one, even if I'm not thrilled with the execution of it all. <laughs> um, Understood. I, I will say, if you actually do the math on a mid-high level duelist, somewhere between, you know, 8 and 12 or so, these guys are sort of like bladed death machines. <laughs> I mean, they, they get a crap ton of attacks per round. They get a whole bunch of bonuses because there's fighting. Let's let's zoom in, not rotate. When fighting opponents armed with weapons other than missiles, Duelist gains bonuses to armor class, simulating his superior skill in parrying blows. He also gains bonuses to hit and damage. So in addition to already hitting on a fighter's table, you get bonuses to hit. And you get an AC bonus just by being a duelist. Oh, by the way, you have to have a wicked high dexterity to become a duelist. So that stacks on top of your existing dex bonus. And you're getting multiple attacks per round. Again, by virtue of being a duelist. These guys really become close combat death machines. They do. Um, and they're, they're hard as hell to kill because they've got 12-sided hit dice. So this... Uh, this, you know, if you're going to kill a duelist, you're going to do it with a bow, right? Well, well, but it's also... <laughs> or a fireball. <laughs> but, but it's also, remember, these guys have no armor class. And for anybody above level 10, armor class is God, unless he's got magic. Yeah, yeah. Um, it, but again, you know, the way to kill a duelist is not to get in a duel with him, right? <laughs> well, right, yes. But the way to do it is to hit him with a with a fireball that takes up one cubic foot of space um, from, yes. from a half mile away. Um, just, just so. So, the, uh, so yeah, that, that, was, that was kind of my takeaway with the Duelist. But of course, you know, this being the, the first issue that I bought off the rack, I immediately went home and created a Duelist character. Even though it says it's an NPC, I didn't care. I wanted to play a Duelist. Um, well, and, and I... It, we talked about this before. I mean, one of the joys of getting your Dragon magazine was, oh, oh, what can I play now? What can I? All right, all right, roll it up, roll it up. What does he look like? Come on. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, all right. Gary, being Gary again. So the Sorcerer Scroll. This was Gary Gygax doing his thing, and you notice it's copyright Gary Gygax, not copyright TSR, because in '83. Gary's are the, the split is already happening here, right? This right. Is, this is already Gary being Gary as opposed to being anybody else. Um, and, uh, and so this is Gary taking a look at a new way to look at the planes and the, the inner planes, the elemental planes, the para-elemental planes. Um, this is a straight-up great crazy article. Oh, yeah. I yeah. mean, it's... it's I am, because largely of the Pazuzu problem, not much given to planar travel adventures, but this gave you a really wicked neat glimpse into the way EGG's head worked. Yeah. And it's it's nuts. And the fact that we're going to wind up with a build-your-own-planar cube oh, yeah. makes Hope. this one a must-have. We're, we're getting there. Hang on a second. Um where the negative material plane touches the four elemental planes are found the other four quasi-elemental planes. The vacuum plane, the salt plane, the ash plane, and the dust plane. Just remember, with all that D&D money came a lot of sweet, sweet drug money for Gary Gygax. <laughs> I'm going to assume you know something the rest of us don't. That's... I shall not be the one to cast aspersions upon the godfather of the hobby. All um, right, very good. I'll move on. 
But yes, you are in fact correct. There is a cube to cut out <laughs> to go spend that two bucks to make the color copy of to cut out so you didn't ruin your magazine. Exqueeze you two <laughs> for a color copy in this year? Uh, uh, I, I, I probably suspect more than it's that. probably closer to five. That that might well have been. Um, the the colors on the computer screen that we are capturing here do not do this cube remote amount of justice at all. Um, one of the other additional hassles is you notice all the planes are labeled on the tabs that are folded inside the cube when you glue it together. Yes. So so that I made do things see helpful. That. Um, but here's the table of outer planes. Um, so this is where we, we have colliding mythologies, right? Olympus, Limp oh, Pandemonium, <coughs> uh, Tartarus, the Nine Hells, Nirvana, Arcadia, the Seven Heavens, and the Twin Paradises, right? Let's, uh, let's just mix and match every possible myth mythological, uh, you know, other world that we can. Noticeably absent is Oz, um, you know. Well, might, have, might as well have added that one in there. So, um, you were going to say something about our planes here. Oh, I, I, I was just going to to scroll over to the uh, scholarship fund. Yeah, I was about to pull that one up for you. I, I knew you would notice that there. I, I, because this is Gary talking again. This is the man himself. Oh, first of all, though, may I note what is with the pretentious capitalization of certain letters <laughs> he starts the article off by writing all scholarly ad and d game aficionados scholarly and aficionados and game are all capitalized what in the blue hell is that about it was a formal title was, that, was it was that a thing could i get a badge that said that there was a secret handshake oh very good but down here, some gentle readers have been reading this journal for a sufficient length of time, well, I hope so, to remember when an eyebrow or two, shall we say, was raised over my expressed opinion of amateur fantasy publications. We talked about this. <laughs> the materials published are suitable for many purposes, including a replacement for toilet tissue. <laughs> <laughs> oh, goodness. So then he says, all of you should be aware that TSR granted five scholarships in 1982. It, <laughs> so, well, no, 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 hold on. You have to back up a step or so. Because the, the phrasing, again, Gygax was not one to accidentally say anything. About two years ago, someone was kind enough to put their money where my mouth was. Right. <laughs> no, a superior amateur publishing effort was not begun. An anonymous benefactor, benefactor or adventure, of adventure gamers contributed a large sum to enable TSR to create a scholarship fund. Yep. Now, 2100 bucks, Folks. That was real money. Not, not long after this, that was one semester's tuition at Marquette University. And that's a private I know school. from... <laughs> I know from personal experience. Yeah. Well, what what would be interesting, since, since you have the alternate computer screen there, see if you can look up what, like, a Honda Accord cost in 1982. All right. On it. I'm, I'm just curious. <laughs> because it's it's not going to be a whole lot more than that. There's there's no way it is. <laughs> so, um. But yeah, there's, uh, there's the address to make the donation to the TSR Foundation to Brian Bloom. <laughs> Send them to Brian Bloom and, and hope that your money actually does what you think it's supposed to do. Its original base price was $8,245. Okay, so this was, this was a, a fourth of a car. So to put that in relative terms today, you know, a baseline Honda Civic is or baseline Honda Accords probably 2500 or 25 grand so that's a you know 5 grand money's, yeah money's about doubled yeah so you know um so yeah you know once upon a time TSR had a scholarship fund for awesome. gamers and and not to go study game design mind you they weren't trying to create necessarily the next generation of game this this wasn't a scholarship fund intended to enhance 
the hobby's bottom line. This was a scholarship fund to give back to the hobby somehow, which is kind of cool, right? I mean, this is this a is to thing. remind. It's it's right there. This is to remind RPGA Network members that exceptional achievement in high school will place them in good standing for the potential receipt of such a scholarship. So, don't spend all your time in class doing cross hatching on the maps you're drawing in your chemistry notebook. Actually, pay attention. Because then, and then he dangles it out there, also do remember that TSR is seeking personnel of high caliber and will be in the years to come. Yeah. So not only can you get 2100 big dollars to go to college on your game hobby, you could one day work for TSR. Yes. Yes, or what's left of it. <laughs> well, back then it was a little bit more than all that. Yes. Yes. Um, here we go. Unlike the military, which puts this inten this page intentionally left blank. No, there's nothing missing from your copy of this magazine. We left it blank on purpose, so anyone who wants to remove it and assemble the cube on the preceding page can do so without destroying valuable information. Except the other half of the sheet of paper where it's stapled into your magazine that is now going to be free-floating and forever detached from your magazine. So Because this sure isn't the centerfold. Yes. Um, all right. Oh, let's note TSR Hobbies offers you the best of both worlds with S&T and Aries because this is right after TSR closed yep. the deal for SPI. <sighs> so in order to subscribe to S&T or Aries, you have to send your money to Dragon Publishing. Yeah, that went well. <laughs> um, the solo scenario, one-player parties are fun for two. And so... This was this was actually a couple of years before they released the X Solo and B Solo modules. So this is where they're still just now sort of sending up that trial balloon in Dragon Magazine for something that later became uh, a more regularly published feature elsewhere in the TSR Pantheon. And so that is something that you would regularly see in Dragon Magazine. You would see ideas floated out there before... They, uh, they sort of became official with the actual publication of a module or a rule book somewhere. Um, so that, that, was, that was something they threw out there. Uh, just out of curiosity, did you ever play a solo adventure somewhere along the way? Just you and a DM? Oh, oh sure. Oh, sure. I mean, I've, there, there were a couple board games from SPI. Uh, gosh, what was it now? They had a dungeon game that was explicitly designed for solo play. They had, uh, I never tried any of the modules, the true modules, but I've played quite a few solo, and I, I will say this, one of the things that I've been meaning to pen a rant about, I, I bought Imperial Assault, the Star Wars miniatures game with the yeah. tiles, I've got Descent, and I've got Gloomhaven on order, but I'm getting to a point now having all three of these in my game space, of wondering why in the hell we are playing these things in a world where role playing games exist. Yeah, I don't get them. Yeah, I am, and everybody I've played them with, they're all my role playing friends. People think my wife, my son, my friends. They all look at these and go, "Well, it's fine. There's nothing wrong with it. Imperial Assault is really fun figs." But I tell you what. Screw the system, screw the tiles, or maybe we keep the tiles, and let's play Savage Worlds yeah. Star Wars. Or, yeah. you know, forget Descent, the game, let's get those awesome minis and throw them out on a Chessex mat and take us down into the Demon Web Pits. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I, don't, I, don't get the, I don't get the hook. I don't get the appeal one little bit. Well, I think one of the... One of the differences in the minds of the designers, I think, and 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 I'm saying I think having, you know, at least gone beyond pencil sketches for my own designs of similar games. Okay. One of the key things in the role playing games is the continued narrative of of taking that single character through multiple adventures through multiple phases of, of his or her life, or its life, I guess. It's a fantasy game. It could be whatever. Um, but, but taking that character and maintaining the same character through improvements throughout the career. 
Sure. And and instead of something like a, a dungeon game or Descent or whatever, I haven't played Gloomhaven, um, Runebound from Fantasy Flight, certainly played there, that yes, a bunch. Yes, um, yes. You improve during the course of that one game session. It, of that one game, it's not necessarily one session because Runebound sometimes can take two or three nights to get all the way through a full adventure. Um, but once that adventure is done, you're done. Like the next time you pick it up, you're working off of new characters, new abilities. New there, there's no you know the 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 term du jour in the board gaming world is the is the concept of legacy games. There's no legacy concept here. And and so every time you sit down to play Descent, you're starting from scratch with a new set of essentially level one characters, and you're starting over. Now, every game of Descent is going to be a little different the way the map evolves. Every game of Runebound is going to be a little different the way that you sort of chase things around the map. But... You're starting from scratch every single time. Whereas role-playing games, you're picking up the same character you've been playing with for a year and a half. And so I think the idea of anybody can grab a character and sit down and play because everybody starts out from scratch is appealing to those who may not feel like they can commit to what they think RPGs need, which is consistent players in a consistent party over a, a extended length of time. See, I, but Imperial Assault has me taking my mini, my card, and all the little cards I've drawn and sticking them in a baggie between sessions so that it stays together as a character. Yeah. I haven't played Imperial Assault, so I don't know. I've played a whole That's, lot of Runebound. I've played a bunch of Descent. I've obviously played a crap ton of Dungeon, mag of Dungeon over the years. Um, you know, I just... I just, if you've got, I, so, solo adventures, and once again, if you're, if you really are by yourself, if you've got nobody else you can play with, all right, but if you've got a gaming group already, why are you playing these other games? Well, but in this case, this isn't necessarily a solo adventure in that you are your own DM, this is one player and a DM, so a single player right. scenario. Right, right. No, and, and that that is what sort of set me down this road because that was my first thought. My second thought is, let me say, one of my best friends who is now in Alaska where he works for the VA, the VA he's a psychiatrist, um, specializing as it is, as it were, it, no, not as it were, but specializing in PTSD. Um, some of my fondest memories of high school are being on the phone with him because he lived on one side of Milwaukee and I lived on the other. And grinding our way through dungeon crawls over the phone late at night. Yeah. Um, there is, if it's just the two of no, 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 that that sense of solo I have done a whole lot of. Yeah. And, and, and so I misspoke earlier when I was talking about the X solo and B solo modules. Really, this yeah, yeah, is yeah. more things like O one and O two. you know, the gym, the staff. Yes. Um, yes. Where it's it's one player and a dungeon master. And, and so I misspoke a little earlier in the way that get, we're referring to this. And in fact, my wife will tell you that as we were getting to know one, one another over two years, two years, 20 years ago, uh, we drove out to a Renaissance fair in Minnesota and the entire car trip from Milwaukee to Minnesota was one long game of tune. Steve <laughs> Jackson's game yep. where I was, I was dungeon mastering. She was playing a character and we didn't so much worry about die rolls because they're not that big a deal in that game. Nope. And we just told a tune adventure on a long car ride. Yeah. It, I think it really does help you understand, especially when, when it's two people working together to craft the story, there is a remarkable level of just letting you see how really wonderful the story, storytelling aspect of good role-playing is. Yes. Yes. And, and the other thing is, it's tough to be a rules lawyer in those circumstances. It's, well, it's tough because it's pointless. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, but here's some specific scenario ideas. So acquiring a desirable object uh, was one of them. Guard duty, right? The idea of guard duty is, uh, is not an unheard of thing. Acquiring information, so go be an intel guy for a bit. 
Um, so there's there's a couple of different options here. Um, there's also the random encounter series, right? Let's just make something up as we go, um, which you know is is a way is is a way to do stuff. Um, but but the idea of just one person and a dungeon master again, this was kind of the trial balloon that was being floated for something that became more official later. Sure. Um, we talk about the way in which minis have been photographed. We've now got some color at least showing up in the advertisements. I do like that they attempted to actually put this bird in flight by sort of anchoring one wing so it just looks like it's banking. I had I had this mini. Awesome. Painting that painting that banner is an immense pain in the one sis. <laughs> I'll bet. Um, the eco the ecology of the catoblepis. Uh huh. All right, we're good. Let's keep going. <laughs> All right, so the whole half ogre ideas for finishing what Gygax started. Now, I never went explicitly looking for it, but I would be real curious to see if there was a Gary Gygax rebuttal to whatever Roger Moore threw out here. I, because you know I, it exists. The question is, did it get published? <laughs> I'm just, I'm just, I'm just gonna say this is so weird. I, 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 I have always been uncomfortable with half orcs and half ogres. Yeah. Well, just because, of, just because of how it happens. And, and we take for granted the instantaneous availability of information of any sort of any way. But Roger Moore here is referencing from the Sorcerer's Scroll in issue 29 of Dragon Magazine as though folks are going to have that readily available at their fingertips. We now, do now, they do note that this column was reprinted in the Best of Dragon Volume 2 anthology, which came out roughly around the same time as this magazine. But still, Rogers just got this assumption, of, eh, just go grab issue 29 and take a look and see what's there. So, um, I do like the Half-Ogre ability scores info over here. Charisma, two d from 2 to 8. <laughs> so... They're dumb and they're ugly, right? I'm just, I'm just saying. I'm not comfortable. I just have never been. I. How do you tell your life story when you're a half ogre? Uh, Mommy and daddy did not go according. Okay, that didn't yeah. happen. In in grunts and snorts and monosyllabic words. I mean, that's. Uh, uh, All right, relief for traveler nobility. Sure, because that, that that apparently was a need. Because what nobles need is some sort of relief, right? There, there. Okay, nothing in this article is as important as the table on the second page. Uh, I'm going to stand back while you have a stroke. You're gonna make me go zoom in on a table, the social standing table. Yeah. Yeah. How does that happen? You can't <laughs> let that go to press. You just can't. <laughs> Somebody did. I, what I want to know is where does this Y belong? Does it belong under 14 or 15? Uh, well, right. Uh, you know. I, are you kidding? Are you are you kidding? Who yeah. saw this? In, we're, we'll, we'll go back. We're going to hard nerd out now. You and I know how paste up works. We've <laughs> done it. We have looked at it and fired it under a camera, which is what these guys had to do. They saw this before it happened. This isn't like it would later be where you would type in a formatting command and it would print out at the other end. This had to be done and printed and seen and then placed under the camera. Yeah. This is giving up. <laughs> this, is, or, this is saying that the nobles in the Traveler universe really didn't need that much relief because we didn't bother to do this at all. Yeah. Part of this, I'm sure, is, hey, uh, can we just get this paste up done so we can get out of here tonight? I'm feeling that. I'm feeling... I'm feeling fatigue, as, booze, uh, long week, something. As a guy who was at his high school newspaper classroom past 2 a.m. on more than one occasion trying to get the paste up done, sure. uh, yeah, there's there's a certain amount of, you know, screw it's close enough going on here. There, there has to be. Um, I, I, they'll figure it out. Hey, look, a Fantasy Games Unlimited ad. Yay, after you. <laughs> You notice they hadn't appeared in our earlier issues up to this point. No, no, now they're, but here they are doing their, doing the V and V all over here, the place. Here they are, and they're going to be all over the place. And uh, how many of us attempted to mimic that pencil sketch? 
on our notebooks in class. Oh, sure. Oh, sure. Uh, photo finish. I, I love this. This is sort of how to take... Many of us who are serious photographers are actually frustrated artists. Not having the talent to draw, we use our cameras to create works of art. Right? So, it's, it's funny. I, uh, I made the comment in my article that appeared on the front page of the Grogheads mythical front page today in fact uh this day in late october that i used to have a 35 millimeter slr camera and so all these things that are being talked about here and all these arcane f stops and f22s and using how, how do you like this the photos on these pages were taken with an olympus om2 using a soligor 35 to 75 az lens and kodak ektachrome 160 tungsten film yeah. Okay. And and you can't tell the difference because they've completely mangled it and paste up, so it's okay. No, no, um, and I'm you know I'm but, sure it's great. But, but it's like, like I, I love top of the the right hand page here the the danse macabre was inspired by the spooky art composition of Sansains. The tombstones were taken from an HO kit by Bachman. Two spotlights were used: a white backlighted key light and a fill light with a blue filter. You know what this, we do this, today? This. Photoshop. <laughs> you don't need Photoshop. You've got oh, what's the name of the oh. uh, the the iPhone app? It's on my phone. Forgot. I'm going to look at it. It's the uh, what's its name? Prisma. Yeah. Whoops. Everybody just just run it through there. Prisma and magic happens. Yeah. There you go. The dragon fire is the result of a double exposure. A piece of acetate was taped over the original photograph, and the smoke was drawn on the acetate with black marker pen. And the fire was scratched, a high contrast piece of black film covered in red gel and double exposed into the smoke area. That looks yep. like that that looks like a Ray Harry Housen paste up. That's it. And but you know what? And you know what? In that 1983, that looked pretty badass. That was an awful lot of work in its day. Yes. Respect. Yes. So um, and our flying eagle attack again, wingtip anchored. So, um, it, it's interesting. I, I would I would be very curious to hand a handful of these tools to a bunch of seventeen and eighteen year olds today, and say, "Go recreate that photo," and see how long it would take them to do it manually with the same kind of tools these guys did, and then give them essentially the same figures and an iPhone, and say, "Go recreate that photo," and see oh, which one gets done they'll, faster. They'll, They'll animate it and have it talking. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Absolutely. No, no, no. One of the great themes, one of the necessary themes of Dragon Up the Past is, uh, to quote Billy Joel, the good old days weren't always good. No. No. And and here, here's the fun trivia part. All right, people, without Google, what song is that from? <laughs> All right, we've talked about the Asgard Minis ad many times in the past. Uh, figure feature, weird monsters. So again, some some interesting monsters here. But again, we're taking pictures of lead minis against a black background, and it's tough to see. It's tough to tell what you're looking at. Um, yep. But the dragon lizard with a sword and the dragon lizard with a mace, they're kind of cool. They're just sort of tough to see. So, um, you know, entertainment value, certainly. But, uh, all right. This is a philosophical ob ph philosophical objection warning. Oh boy, for this article. Uh huh. Well, it. What I found interesting about this article, again, as as the wide eyed kid pulling this as my first, you know, of my Dragon magazines. So of course, you know, I read the entire thing cover to cover like that afternoon, and then the next day, and the day after that, and the day after that. Um, it. While the idea of statting this entire thing out as a system is a little nuts, the reality is, you know, as, as, as a young teenage kid, you know, with his first forays into fantasy gaming, you don't really think about these things until somebody brings it up in an article here. Hey, it does make sense that when I get in my 12th consecutive sword fight that somehow, you know, Maybe the blade got a little nicked. Maybe there's there's some you know maintenance that I need to perform on my on my equipment to keep it working the way it should every single time. Um, so so this isn't a bad concept. So philosophical 
rant. Go for it. Or did I just derail you? <laughs> I, I, I know. No, 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 no. I mean, you're, you're, that's the other side of it. That's the other side of the argument. What game are you playing? You're, it's, it's this pursuit of realism. that this, this is the level of realism I fundamentally object to. Yeah. If, if you want to build in a system that says if you roll a critical failure, something bad happens, you break. If you want to build in a system that says if you are so stupid as to hit an adamantium or an adamantine object with your metal sword, it shatters, I have no problem with that. I do not wish to play a game, to live an adventure, to have an adventure where I'm darning my socks, pressing my pants, and making sure that my new shirt is laid out for the morning inspection before the castellan of the keep on the borderlands. Yeah. yeah I, no. I just I just don't I don't like games that do that. Some games, of course, Diablo most famously, builds it in as a check against it basically tries to level out the cash problem, and it really doesn't at the end of the day. But by and large, as these wear systems, these decay systems, have crept into gaming, they've been as effect, you know, they've been as a a, a a way of trying to manage certain gaming problems. Yeah. But no, no, mm -mm. keep it well wide from me. I'm not doing that paperwork. <laughs> well, and, no way. and we actually we talked about it on a broadcast. Um, actually two different occasions very similar concepts to what you're talking about on one of them um metal dog brought up the idea of some of the role-playing games out there just seem very checklist driven sort of do this then do this then do this and it's he, he's like i do that in real life i don't need to try and do that and call it fun just because it happens to have a dragon on the screen somewhere um, right but we uh we also uh you know, on at least one of the podcasts with Mirth, I you can't say the one with Mirth after this past season because he was on half of them. Um, the uh, there was a discussion of, um, you know, the the level of detail that you sometimes find in something like a squad leader gets a little ridiculous, and and people will make fun of that level of crunchiness or or something like Campaign for North Africa, obviously being the the most ridiculous of them all. Um, people will make fun of that level of detail in a war game, and yet you've got role players that turn around that if your equipment list doesn't list at least two pairs of wool socks, then you're going to take frostbite damage from not being able to change them overnight, right? <laughs> and and mm -hmm. where, where is the, what's the fun factor there? Now, for somebody, that probably is fun. I'm not that somebody, <laughs> and, and I right. don't think you are either. So that's that's and look, if that's the game you want to play, of course, go play it. But keep <laughs> don't it invite away me for me. <laughs> yeah. Don't invite me. I'm good. No. Um, Nonviolent magic items. So this was kind of cool. Now, you know, look, it's it. This is the 80s. We have to have a chart. But um, somebody somebody spent quite a bit of time concocting these things. Dark green glass bottle about the size of a half gallon milk carton. With a screw top, any liquid placed in the bottle will maintain its current temperature indefinitely. <clears throat> mm -hmm. Large wooden glass hourglass filled with yellow particles. It records the passing of eight hours when turned over, after which a deep chime rings out ten times. So it's a it's a stopwatch, but it's, no, but it's uh, I I these lists we talked about this. I love the cantrips. I love this. Yes, this stuff is this stuff is fun. This stuff is interesting, and I might actually use. I love fifty five. Which one was 50? Hold on, i got to scroll over there to get to it. It's on the next page, isn't it? Uh, yeah. Yeah. Where are we? 55. Let's get zoomed in on 55. A pair of Onyx dice. The dice will give whatever result the roller desires. <laughs> and the one above it isn't too bad either. In a yeah. different way. Yep. A pair, pair of calf-high dress boots can be bought to a brilliant shine by a single swipe of a cloth, but events violent enough to break the leather... Destroy the shine. Yes, those are E4. Like that. Those are E4 boots right there. <laughs> there. <laughs> Everybody in the service. Uh, I wonder if our reverend from our previous episode would have objected to the characterization of this one. A wine cup. Once per day, this cup turns ordinary water within it into high quality wine. No magic word is required. There. <laughs> <laughs> 
terrible, you know. Why not? But yeah, these these were fun in that they showed off a great level of creativity and, and, and you know, probably inspired a couple of other good ideas here and there. Um, Ooh, and, I will, and I will tell you, if we ever go back in the last episode, we talked about a uh, Napoleonic skirmish game. Man, any general in the Napoleonic Wars would have liked 58. Uh, blank parchment scroll. Hold on, let me not rotate. Let me zoom. Uh, anything written upon it can be read only by the writer and by those whose names are written on the scroll. Yes, that would have been quite awesome. That 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 definitely would have been quite awesome. Um, but I think one of the neat things about this also is um, these magic items lend themselves well to telling to to incorporating themselves into telling a story. And it's not just, here's a new and better way to beat on people, but right. how, how do I use that cantrip? How do I use this, this nonviolent magic item in, in the pursuit of whatever quest or adventure I'm in? And how can, I, how can I use this to further my, oh, I've got this magic item. It'll do this. Let me pretend that I can cast the spell to turn the water into wine and, and do this. Um, Oh boy, the Astros just lost the game. Sorry, they uh, they just gave up a three run home run in the top of the ninth. Ouch! Which will tell anybody listening to this when we recorded this now at this point. Um, so yeah, that's kind of ugly. It's it's six one, top of the ninth. Uh, it's a bad day for the Astros. It's been a bad sports day for me all around, man. NC State lost. Ohio State won. This this is crap. Um, Should have stayed in bed today. All right. Is there is there a nonviolent magic item for reverse sporting event outcome? Can we find I, I that one? I didn't notice one, but <coughs> there's, excuse me, there's quite a few. Is left to find. Left to make sure we look. Yeah, there ought to be. Um, the Forest of Doom. So again, back when we included adventures, um, so four to eight characters, fourth to seventh level. Um, I look. I don't know what all the module design contest categories were, but around the 70s and 80s, you saw a whole lot of these module design contest winners popping up. Um, you know, a fairly randomly located sort of place. Um, but but an interesting little adventure um, where the forest, home to all manner of vicious animals and evil-minded denizen, singular, not plural, the animals are generally only dangerous when one intrudes in their territory. Um but you've got to make your way through the the forest to get into the lands of Launut for whatever reason it was that you were after there. Um, you know, what did we do? We built a dungeon inside a tree, which is kind of a cool idea. Um, there's a sludge pit, because we needed a sludge pit. Um, but yeah, this is, this is what you've got. You've got your basic dungeon crawl um, just tucked into a tree instead. Uh, which was kind of neat. This this wasn't a half bad module. Uh, this is certainly not something you're going to spend more than a weekend on. Uh, but one thing to note, um, the artwork has significantly upgraded over the earlier issues that we were looking at um, to, to where the artwork is, is not bad anymore. Um, there's actually some professionalization to this at this point, um, which is kind of cool. I imagine there's probably more than one person on the planet at this point in time who is making a living as a fantasy artist for magazines. That's right. And that's, that's the change that came. And, uh, but there's still, this is still as old school as it gets. And it just makes me feel real good inside. Yep. Yep. It's kind of cool. Uh, some top secret critters, uh, some various tools that you could have. Um, Hey, look, some fantasy games, unlimited ads. This time for daredevils. Look at that. Yes, there was Daredevils and Space Opera. Um, I want to draw some attention to the Dragon Tree Press ad on the next page over here, if I can get it to zoom in for me. Um, come on, zoom for me. It's not zooming for me. Um, I had a couple of these, actually, um, from Dragon Tree Press way back when. Um, a rare way of viewing the wish. So again, people putting way too much thought into, you know, kind of random happenstance. But, well, but and, some neat and, ideas in there. But for for nerd slackers, yes, I would argue there is no greater thing than the wish. <laughs> you know how exactly can you 
bugger someone who attempts a wish. Yeah. I mean, I I don't know a DM that I've ever been associated with. I have never granted one of my characters a wish. Never, not one time, won't happen. Don't ask. But everybody that I know, and that runs to the dozens, um, including some pretty famous guys in the world of writing this, and I can tell you that the the man who wrote the man who wrote Pathfinder and I have had this exact conversation. The principal reason you stick a wish in a game is to let people screw themselves because they don't think about what their words mean. <laughs> yeah. So so that that's what that's about. There you go. Um, <clears throat> all right. There's a back issue ordering piece, uh, patching the cracks in champions. So how do we fix champions? Because, you know, it needed fixing. Just out of That's, curiosity, from the Duncan <laughs> Company down here, did you, uh, did you ever order any of the cast-your-own minis, little rubber blocks to, to make your own lead figures? Who are you asking? You. Of course. <laughs> Good Lord. We, uh... uh Mine, mine were always the, uh, oh, keep talking, I'll come up with the name of them. <laughs> I have, I, I still have quite a few, actually. Well, we had, I had two sets of them that I managed to find and scrounge when I was living over in Germany. One of them was a set of elves, and one of them was a set of wraiths, so. Prince August was mine. Yes, those were uh, all I, over the place when I was in Europe. Yeah, I did, I, I have quite a few sets of Prince August uh, typically 54 millimeter though. Yeah. Yeah. I like to, I like to, if I always said I want, if I'm going to, if I'm going to risk harming myself in the manner of Johnny Tremaine, yeah. I'm bloody well going to, uh, I'm going to do it for a 50, 54 millimeter fig. Something that's easier to paint. The, Did, uh, uh -huh. the Sagittarian again, short fiction in dragon magazine. Um, yep. back when, uh, you know, the dragon magazine, would actually publish short fiction. So um, we had a much earlier Dragon Magazine where they had to add pages in order to complete all the short story, and apparently some readers griped about the fact that there was even fiction in Dragon. Um, I love this. Selfish motives, all for all, not one for one. Let's not have selfish players in in D&D, &D. and yet... You know, some of the best games out there were people all working at cross purposes, where you give everyone their own motivation, but they're all, you know, they might need to cooperate to get a couple things done, but by and large, they're all working across each other. Um, find me, find me, find me, any work of fiction. Let's take, let's take the greatest of them all, the Fellowship of the Ring. Yeah. How many different sets of motives does Tolkien place in that group of nine people? Yeah. Well, three of them in Boromir. <laughs> I mean, well, Boromir goes so far as to, I don't know, try to kill the guy with the ring. Yeah. Yeah, no kidding. So, so, so you know, you could pretty well spare me the idea, selflessness is the only way to role play. Yeah. Uh, probably my favorite story ever is my buddy playing a chaotic, I think he was true, I think he was chaotic neutral thief who just was upset by the fact that his party was going to be able to kill this dragon tomorrow because they felt that he had, they'd figured out a cheap way to do it. Yeah. So he went in in the middle of the night, woke the dragon up, told him what the deal was and left. Went back and got greased with the rest of the party. Afterwards, he said, yeah, I, I took the dungeon master aside and told him I'd tell the dragon. Why? Because that's what my character would freaking do. Because he's chaotic neutral, and that's what they yeah, do. Yeah, that's, that's what they do. I'm role-playing to alignment. <laughs> and everyone wanted to beat the hell out of him. Yeah. But at the same time, that's what you do. The idea that you only... Now, let's have a rule here. Don't be a dick. But, <laughs> I, I mean, is what, what are we... Oh, so that, that, sir, is a silly, silly article. <laughs> Um, Castles by Carol. They used to have some pretty nice historical castle imagery in here. Oh yes, but they don't. Very nice. Yeah, they don't give you a ton of detail on them. Um, the Star Trek no, correspondence they're... game. I just, I can't, I can't even. I want to know what this was. 
I mean, they, they, they clearly just, I mean, what, three, pa- you get three pages of narrative. This must be on the fashion of a classic Chris Engel Matrix game. Perhaps. But I, I don't think the Chris Engel Matrix games existed yet. No, they don't. But I'm saying it sounds like them. Yes. Yes, it does. Um, no, I just wish I could have played it. So, File 13 Errata. We'll, we'll get to the File 13 game at one point in one of these episodes. Um, there are three reviews to bring up here uh, over the next couple of pages. So, there's there's Moonbase, Clavius, there's Grav Armor, and there's Dragon Master. What is interesting about these is, at one point in my life, I owned and played all three of these. <clears throat> there, there you go. Moonbase Clavius is is actually not too bad. It's an interesting uh, Marines versus Russians fight on the moon, uh, which is kind of cool. What's what's neat is that the Marines have nuclear mortars. Um, so the, the Davy Crockett gets deployed to space. Um, but the, the Marines have nuclear mortars out there. Uh, Grab Armor has a fairly interesting mechanic that is actually one that I I adapted my the 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 zone of control mechanic in the Bayonet Games Warfighter series that I published 10 12 years ago is heavily inspired by uh, by Grab Armor and the way in which um, one unit's movement can be interrupted by another one firing. And it makes for an interesting little chess match between the two opponents of uh, what it what it really does is it gives you the ability to draw fire with one unit to allow others more freedom for maneuver because while you move sequentially, your opponent has to choose whether or not to react as you are moving. So the ones that you choose to expose first, your opponent has the option to sort of try to pin those down quickly, but... If they do, then other units you've got available have some freedom for maneuver. If they don't, they're taking a chance on letting somebody get by that they shouldn't. Um, but that's that's a mechanic that was heavily inspired by some of the rules from Grav Armor. You can actually still find this one available for free as a download online if you go poking around for it. A lot of the, uh, the old Heritage Series games are available for free as a print and play. Um, and then Dragon Master, it says, you know, a classy looking card game. It, it was a classy looking card game. It, it was crap. I mean, it was, it was spades with better looking cards is really what it was. It wasn't that good. Um, but it, it looked gorgeous. You just needed a better thing to do with the cards. Um, but, but I had and played all three of the games that were mentioned in this magazine. Dragon Master, I actually had at least a year before this issue, before I ever saw this issue of the magazine. Um, so clearly they weren't worried about current reviews. So. Just uh, scrolling through all the available Graf Armor stuff still has quite the uh, yeah has quite the following based on it's, the uh, the look of things. It's a good game. The maps were atrocious. They were they were some of the they, ugliest they, they, damn maps they, you've ever seen. The maps have been completely redone. Yes, the redone maps look good. The maps that came out of the box look like canned ass. They were awful. Mm. Um, we have a Fantasy Games Unlimited ad. Um, <laughs> that, well, can't, can't swing a dang cat. <laughs> yeah, let's, uh, let's keep moving here. Um, we have East Con. Uh, we have our convention schedule that goes on quite a ways. Oh, but over on the right. Well, hang there on. Before you are. get over there. there I want to make note, at the top of the convention schedule, Marcon 18 in Columbus, Ohio. So this was Marcon 18 in 1983. Marcon still happens in Columbus, Ohio around Memorial Day every year. Bless them. It's still there. It's, it's multiple alternative realities is what the, the MAR and that stands for. And so it's a okay. fantasy and sci-fi convention that's been going on for 40 years now. Look at that. Yeah. All right, there's your Gen Con Game Fair update. Ah, uh, there they are. Hey, fellas. It's, they're playing. They're at UW Parkside. They're clearly in one of the classrooms, and they've got people sitting up there in the class chairs watching a big game. But, boy, oh, boy, look at, folks, look at that vendor hall on the right. Look at You can just see it's filled with gloom havens and terraforming Mars and <laughs> all the other games that are packed in there now, and people... Look how much room you had. Well, here's the that's that's what the exhibit hall at Gen Con today looks like at two a.m. 
Right. Right. <laughs> That's after everybody has gone to bed and it's just a bunch of vendors that have forgotten to go home. Yeah. Or are still talking to each other. <laughs> I got Origins is a bigger bustle than this by a sight. Yeah. Um, the Strategist Club Awards, they're asking for you to write in your outstanding there, board game. There. Outstanding there gameplay aid. <laughs> there they are. They want you... They, but, but it's not... They don't. You're not voting for them yet. They want you to write in your... No, votes. no. Right, right, right. These are your nominations. Um, Phil and Dixie. So this, this was my first you know, real exposure to Phil and Dixie that I could go back and reread multiple times. And you kind of had to, to get all the humor in this one, but it's, it's, uh, it's, it's LARP meets, uh, sort of the, uh, what was the D and D offshoot that let you rule a kingdom? The whole point was to be ruling the kid, your birthright. It's, oh, it's, sure. it's LARP meets birthright. Oh, <laughs> it's only a matter of time before they were seized upon by the idle rich. I say, Cecilie, I haven't had so much fun since I sold Painter's, uh, Painter's Polo Pony to that dog food company. Right? <laughs> so, the, uh, it's, it's sort of lifestyles are rich and famous. Uh, going into LARP, you know. Looking for something for your new cleric? Then W&M's Deity of the Month Club is for you. Each month you get to try out an entirely new religion, painstaking re painstakingly researched by W&M's experts, complete with temple priests, temple maidens, temple furniture, temple guards, and temple. So, you get to go through a whole bunch of these. Um, there's Wormy, and, uh, and then some dragon mirth, some humor in here. Uh, your teleport spell may need a little work. I love the one at the bottom left over here with this new weapon. How can we lose? <laughs> and the tanks in the distance. Um, oh, but... I Okay, I did not know Jack Chick drew for the dungeon. <laughs> look, look at the art on this. Oh, yeah. That is, is, I remember this ad. I remember this ad very well. This is creepy as hell. The, the Star Frontier ad? Yes. Yeah, the, the, the kid in the number one jersey with half an arm. Yeah, what is that? Does, <laughs> does, who drew? Oh, it's so weird. Yeah, he's, he's got that horribly deformed arm. Well, that's why he's dropping his dice all the time. Well... Well, so there's there's two ways we can look at it. One, we can say it's a really bad artist. Two, uh -huh. we can say it was a very early initiative at inclusivity and diversity of those who were differently abled. Okay, I thought you were going to say it's because they have a woman at the table. That too. But uh, it's funny. I uh, We talked about Star Frontiers in the context of who would play Buck Rogers when you could play Star Frontiers. Yeah. Uh, and now here we see the ad. I held a fairly decent copy of Star Frontiers in box in my hands at Half Price Books today and almost brought it back. They wanted 50 for it, but... Uh, yeah, 50 is a little steep. Yeah, that was a little steep. But that was... God, there's... You, you should point out to them, if you're Half Price Books, you should be selling it for half of what it was originally retailed for at list. I thought that was the theory, which means this should probably cost me 10 bucks. It, six and a quarter. It was 12.50 originally in retail, I believe. There you go. So, yeah. Here's your, here's your seven. Keep the change. I'm leaving with Star Frontiers. <laughs> the box set. Whoop. And in this edition of Games Nobody and, Played. And this was the original, not the Alpha Dawn version. Right. Oh, no. This is the one I had. And as I say, I actually ran a Star Trek adventure using Star Frontiers. Yeah. yeah. We, uh, we, by the time my D&D &D group had grown fairly substantially to include Nick Seidler. Hey, Nick, if you're listening, uh, who's now the line head for the Doctor Who role-playing game. He, uh, Nick, Nick was one of, I believe, one of the crew. We actually took over a classroom, and we tried to set up the chairs sort of like the deck of the Enterprise. <laughs> and everybody sitting at their station. We were a little bit ahead of Jeff Engelstein and uh, his game Space Cadets. Yeah. So, um, all right, Merp on the back page. Again, I see, um, so, so, you know, again, Iron Crown Enterprise advertising probably was a significant contributor to Dragon's Bottom Line for a long time. Yeah, um, no doubt. Again, I know a lot of people who read Merp products. I don't know anybody who ever played Merp. Sure not. So, it, and it's not like between the two of us, 
we've spent a whole lot of time hanging out in obscure little corners of the role-playing world. I mean, we've been pretty squarely in the thick of lots of role-players and uh, don't know a single person who ever actually played Merp. There you go. So, anyhow, Dragon 73 holds a special place in my heart as the first one that I ever purchased off the rack. Um, and, uh, and, you know, again, this is one that I probably know better than most just from it being the one that I had that I read cover to cover to cover to cover multiple times because it was mine. And, uh, and I loved it. And somewhere out in the game den, I still have that original copy of Dragon 73 that I bought way back when. So great. Yep. Yep. We're nerds, dude. We totally are. Oh, yes. <laughs> if they haven't figured that one out, we're in real trouble. Yeah, or they are. <laughs> Failed their perception roll with a negative. <laughs> So, um, all right. Well, thanks, folks, for listening to Dragon Up the Past. Um, tell you what, Jim, for uh, for this next one, um, email me which issue you want, and I will make sure not to look at it before we start the, the broadcast. That's a deal. All right, guys. Uh, have a beautiful morning, evening, afternoon, or night, whatever time is appropriate for when you're watching this.